Hello, how are you doing? It's another pleasure being here. And uh, today I'd like to speak about your standing versus your state as a Christian. So do you know your standing, where you stand, and also your state right now? You see, these are two very confusing words, but uh, by the end of this topic, you're going to understand exactly what I mean when I talk about standing and state, all right? So now, uh, there are so many people who believe that they are saved based on their works. They believe I've been saved, uh, but because I did this and this and this and this, I've always talked about that. But they are not. Because the Bible tells us very well in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You're not saved by yourself. It is by grace that you're saved, all right? Uh, through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you should not boast that I did this, I did that, I am good, I am that. No. I always say two kinds of people will enter heaven. Righteous people like Jesus, people who are purely righteous from, uh, you know, all time. They have never done one sin. And forgiven people. So who are you? Are you forgiven or are you righteous? So if you say, I am righteous, then you're blaspheming actually because there's the bible tells us there's no unrighteous there's totally no unrighteous you have all done sins i am a filthy wretched uh, person who deserves only mercy i can't get to heaven through my own works i can't save myself there's nothing that you can do uh, that you can be able to gain salvation by yourself no there is nothing so the bible is very clear about this it already tells us that we are saved only by grace so first you have to understand one thing the bible tells us in ephesians 1 13 in whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom that you uh, in whom in whom also after you believed you were sealed with that holy spirit of promise so you are sealed with the holy spirit of promise you have been told that once you believed you're sealed so the bible still tells us in verse 14 which is the earnest of our inheritance of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory so if we are told that you have been purchased by believing in the word of truth, so what is that word of truth that we need to believe in? And what is that gospel of your salvation that you need to believe in? Because you have been told in whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So we have to know which is this gospel of our salvation, which is this word of truth that we need to know. And the word of truth the gospel of our salvation is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I always like to repeat this because there might be someone who has never heard the gospel watching these videos and maybe this might be the only hour that you can be able to understand and hear the gospel. So, uh, the gospel talks about what jesus did for us we can just go there and read uh for for a moment let me just uh take you through just for a minute moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand so you stand in the gospel all right so here we already understand one thing that we stand in the gospel we stand in the gospel all right so that's very important to understand that so we are standing in that gospel by which also you're saved if you keep in memory what i preached unto you unless you have believed in vain so we are saved by the gospel we stand in the gospel we are saved by the gospel if we keep in memory what paul preached to us because paul He's telling us that he did not get it from himself. Listen, what he says in verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So he received from someone who is Jesus Christ. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that is a gospel. How that Christ died. How did Christ die? He shed his blood. 
His blood became our propitiation. Propitiation is the act of appeasing wrath, the wrath of God. So for those people who think that, um, you see, uh, we are saved because the Romans, they killed Jesus on the cross and then after he died. No, the Romans killing Jesus on the cross, that was not the main thing. It is because God himself, God the Father, he, he, it pleased him to crush Jesus at the cross. To pour down all the anger that he had on sin. And through that, we were able to be forgiven. There is no way we could have. God is a righteous God. He's a righteous judge. And there is no way he's going to forgive a sinner. No. Listen to this. Many people might be saying, no, he forgives sinners. No. He's a righteous judge. For him to be able to do what is right. Because God cannot. Think of it. You get someone killing your family, your sisters, your brothers, your parents, your wife and kids, the murderer there, and then you get him, uh, you know, red-handed, and then you tie him up, and just at that time you call uh, the police, and they come, and then they take this guy. There's pure evidence. This, this guy has killed all your family. You have the evidence. You got it on tape. And then he's taken to the judge. And then the judge says, wow, I'm a very righteous judge. I'm a good judge. I'm a forgiving judge. Uh, you murder, I think I'll forgive you. What are you going to do next? You're going to say, I've never seen a very evil judge as this one. He's, you will even write to the president and tell him, no, this, this is unacceptable. The same way, God is a righteous judge. He has to... He has to be righteous. He has to do what is right. The wages of sin is death. So somebody had to die for you to be, uh, be free. So Jesus himself, he died at the cross so that God can demonstrate his judgment, which is his righteousness. Because if we could have just said, okay, you guys, you have sinned, but anyway, I forgive you. Is that, is that justice? No. No. That's why we are told we are justified. That's a legal term saying we are made to be just through the blood of Jesus Christ, what he did for us. All right, without wasting much time, let me get into details. Now, we have our standing versus state, all right? The standing versus state. Let me write here. This is the standing. All right, and then we have state. So, I want to give a difference between these two. And be able to show you what exactly this entails. All right. The standing versus state. Let me put it like this so that I can have some space also to write some other things. So now the standing versus state. Now the standing is your position in Christ. So your standing is literally your position in Christ. All right, that is your standing, where you stand in accordance to Christ. This is your condition every day. Condition every day. That's your state, your everyday condition. And also we see that uh, your position in Christ, this, this involves your soul and spirit. All right. This is your soul and spirit. And this one is the flesh. All right? Or the body. So having understood that, I think now we can go and continue. We'll be able to see what the Bible talks about this. Uh, now, uh, let's see this. In Philippians 4.11, the Bible says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So Paul is telling us whichever state, whichever state I am. So what is he talking about? Does the standing change? No, the standing doesn't change, but the state change changes. Paul is saying, my state can change. So whichever state I am, I am still comfortable because my standing will not change. My standing in Christ will not change. So this means your condition or your state may change, but your standing according to God remains the same. Your, your standing remains the same. So the first one is that we see that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The first thing, the first thing here, your standing, the first thing is that you're sealed 
all right sealed with holy spirit so that's the first thing that happens once you're saved let me first talk about the standing yeah you're sealed with the holy spirit let's see this ephesians 1 13 i had spoken about that in whom also in whom he also trusted after that you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation he knew also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So immediately you believe, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So that is the first thing that happens when you're saved. You're saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So once you have the Holy Spirit inside you, he can live. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So you are sealed to a specific time. You are not sealed only until you sin or only until you do something. You are sealed until the day of redemption. The day that you are redeemed of this flesh. Alright? The second thing is you become a new creature. The Bible tells us that you are now a new creature. A new creature creature a new creature so now once you're saved you're no longer the person that people knew you're a new creature all right in galatians 6 15 the bible says for in christ jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature so now we are told that we become a new creature we are circumcised with the circumcision not made with hands let, let me show you also in second corinthians 5 17 the bible says therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature all things are passed away behold all, all things have become new the bible is telling us we are a new creature and a creature is something totally different from the old one if you pick a dog and you pick an elephant, those are two different creatures. They have different DNA, they have different styles of life, they eat differently, they do things differently. Totally everything is different. The way they, 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 they do their things, even their sizes are different. So you're a new creature with everything totally different. So how can you go back to the old creature? If you, if you have some maize, for example, we know uh the, there is the original maize eh, that you, you 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 can get in the field and then there's a gmo genetically modified uh whatever uh, k kind of a species now when you modify this kind of crop into another new kind of crop how will it go back again to the old crop it can't be it's a new thing it is totally new so the bible tells us we are a new creature and for those who say you can lose your salvation you ask them how can i lose <laughs> this creature how can i go back to the old creature it's not possible all right so how do you become a new creature the bible tells us we become a new creature through spiritual circumcision you know before in the older days in the old testament there had to be a literal circumcision whereby a flesh is cut the, it all started when god gave instructions to abraham it said uh, eight days, make sure all your children, all the Jews are, are circumcised. I think that was a foreshadow of what was to come. The spiritual circumcision to be cut off. Because unless a Jew was circumcised, he, he, he was not considered a Jew. Every Jew had to. Jesus had to. Moses had to. Everybody. So that one was showing us what would come in the future. And you see very well what the Bible says here. The Bible already tells us, we have, we have seen here in, uh, in uh, Galatians 6.15, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything. So now, if it was really important, then why are we told that now circumcision avails nothing? <laughs> hmm? Or uncircumcision, but a new creature. Because the new creature is already circumcised spiritually by Jesus Christ. Let's see. Colossians 2.10-11, uh, it says... And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we are told we are circumcised by the circumcision not of hands. So God himself literally operates the soul, cutting your flesh from the soul. All right? God himself operates you. He operates your body, your full body, and cutting off the soul from the body. So it's like, uh, 
it's like this. You know, we have uh, three parts. We have the body, body, soul, and spirit. But of course, we know the spirit is dead before you're saved. So now, when you're saved, literally, God cuts off the body and he makes this a new creature, all right? New creature. So he cuts off the body. According to God, the body is dead, okay? Now, according to God, the body is dead. And he doesn't uh, care anything about that. He knows already. Now, this is a different person. This is a different creature. And uh, having understood that, we already know that now, let, let's even, Colossians uh, 2.12 says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein you also reason with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. So you're buried with him in baptism and, you know, through the operation. So God does the spiritual operation of making you a new creature. He, he does it behind the scenes. All right. So now what happens, let me draw this here. This is a man, uh, forgive my drawings, I'm, I'm very poor in art, but let me just draw something here. So this is a, a, a human being, when he's born, every human being has three parts, whether you're Christian, you're a pagan, you're who, you're, I mean, whether you're, of course, you're not born Christian, eh? whoever person that you are, you have three parts, you have the body, the outer cover, the body, you have the soul, and then you have inside the spirit. All right? You have the three parts. But then, before you're born, uh, I mean, when you're born, your spirit is dead. Your spirit is dead. We are told that you are born in the image of Adam. Adam. That is in, go, go check uh, Genesis 5.3. It says we are now in the image and likeness of Adam because we are all sinners. Everybody is a sinner. We're in that likeness. But now when you get saved, the Holy Spirit gets sealed inside you. So now we have the Holy Spirit inside us. The moment you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit come inside you. All right? And makes you a new, new, new thing. A very different thing. All right? So now when you have the Holy Spirit inside you, what was now blank, now it has the Holy Spirit inside. All right? And this new creature, the body now, according to God, is cut off. So God cuts off this body. And he says, no, now I'm only concentrating with this. And he has cut off the body. So this new body, which, which is here, this new body, is sinless. This new creature is sinless. It has the Holy Spirit inside, so it cannot sin. It is sinless, so it is already washed with the blood of Jesus Christ inside. But the body can sin. This one is sinful. <laughs> you see, many people will not understand this. A Christian, if you ask, can a Christian sin? Yes and no. The new man cannot sin. The Bible tells us very well in 1 John that the new man cannot sin. But then... The body can sin. It's sinful. You can do, you can, you can do all the, the dirty things that you've always thought. You know, the, the flesh is the five senses. I, I hear this. I smell this. I want to touch this. I want to do this. That, that's the flesh. That's why we are told to walk in the, in the spirit, not in the flesh. Because the flesh will want to sin. But this is sinless. All right? So having understood that, I think we are, we are getting somewhere. So now, the next thing is, we know that we are forgiven of all sins. Forgiven. Forgiven. All sins. That's the next thing which happens. We are forgiven all sins once we are saved. Colossians 2.13 says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, so now, if we are forgiven all trespasses, this is the standing. God, according to him, when you're saved, he has forgiven you all your sins at the cross. Once he died for you and you trusted that, you trusted the gospel, this gospel here, already you've been forgiven all your sins. According to him, you have no sin. That's the standing. So Paul tells us we are saved and forgiven by Christ. 
And Paul says, yes, I'm forgiven. But <laughs> as a matter of fact, my state is, my flesh is still one of the, you, you see Paul is even saying, I'm the chief of all sinners. But I'm forgiven of my sins. I am a sinner who has been forgiven. Let, let me just show you somewhere where Paul is talking about him being a chief of all sinners. Let's go to, let's go to what? Let, let's go to 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 Timothy 1.15. See what Paul is saying. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. <laughs> Paul is saying, hey guys, Jesus came to save us, to forgive us our sins. But hey man, I'm already the chief of all sinners. My flesh is sinning every day. I feel to sin. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. So now having understood that, let's see the fourth thing. The fourth thing is we are born again. We become sons of God. We are born again. All right. Born. We are born again. We become son of God. All right. We become born again. Let's see. John 1 12. The Bible says, but as many as received him to them, Gave he power to become the sons of God, even unto them that believe on his name. So you become a child of God. You're born again. All right. You become a child of God. Let's see verse 13, which talks about being born. Which were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, but of the will, uh, not the will of man, but of God. So you're born again, not by flesh. The flesh, no. You're born by the will of God. Mm? So now you're a son of God. And also we can see 1 John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall be like him, for we shall see him as, it, as he is. So we are told we are already now born again. Can you be unborn? Can you say... I'm not really sure if I'm born. I think, uh, yeah, it's like saying, I'm not really sure if my mother really bore me. Uh, Mom, did you really bore me? You, you see, you can't. Even if you hate and say, ah, I'm having a lot of trouble in this world. I think I, I don't want to be born. No, you're already born, you're born, you're born. Okay, so the same happens. When you're born in the spirit, you're born, you're born, 100%. You become a child of God, you become a son of God. So you can't be unborn. The other thing, number five, is justified. We are justified. We are justified. So being justified, what does it mean? It means we are completely just. Like, it's like we have never done anything. We are just if I had not sinned. You're justified by Jesus Christ. Let's see. In Acts 13, 38 to 39, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So with Jesus, you are justified. Justifying is a legal term, which means... You are, you are now clean. You are totally clean. There is no anything. Nobody can wake up and say, uh, you have not done it the right way. No, you are justified. All right? So that one already tells us something, that Jesus can justify you. And let's see, uh, Romans 3.20, it says something. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Law comes to show us what sin is. But now Jesus comes to justify us. And then he tells us now, after you believe in Jesus, you're no longer under the law. It's like I was talking to somebody and telling them that, you see, you being saved by Jesus Christ, by the cross, and you still want to follow the law, is like coming out from, coming from Kenya, and you go to the Amazon forest, and when you're in the Amazon forest, you still want to follow the laws in Kenya. You, you're saying, you know, in Kenya, we are told we have to do this and this and this. And if I'm here in Amazon forest with the, with the Bushmen, there's a certain law I have to follow in Kenya because maybe these guys might arrest me. It, it, it's like getting so confused. 
in the jungle there, the law is not the one that you follow. There is no that constitution of care. So what are you following in that constitution? No. You're in the jungle. You're in a different place. You're totally different. So you're following those laws. is like you, you, you're just enslaving yourself. Yes, you will do whatever. Mm, we'll say uh, our president says do this, do that. Don't touch this. Don't do that. But you're in a different place. Don't follow the law. Follow the new law which is there, which is only believing in what has been said. Believe in Jesus and listen to what the Holy Spirit is directing you now. Now you're no longer being led by the law, but you're led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is guiding you. He's telling you, go this way, don't go this way, this way. You know, follow Jesus, okay? Romans 3.24, it says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified freely. So justification is free. Once you believe in Jesus, you're justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So Christ Jesus brings redemption. Like I said before, redemption is you're freed forever. Remission, the, the sins go and they come back again. But now Jesus came to bring redemption before it was remission. Sins go a little bit, uh, you, again you sin, you go and sacrifice another animal, another remission, you know. It was always go and come, go and come. But when Jesus came, he brought redemption. Redemption is once and for all. All right. Romans 3.28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith with all the deeds of the law. So the only way you can get justified is by faith, faith in the gospel. Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way you will ever have peace by coming to God in your own works, saying, I am good, I can do this, I can do that. There is no way you can be justified, all right? Only by faith. Romans 5 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath, wrath through him. So there are three things which you are justified by by grace, by faith, and by the blood of Jesus Christ. That one is very clear. 1 Corinthians 6 11. And such were some of you, but you are washed. Hmm? But you're washed, but you're sanctified, but, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our Lord. <laughs> He says, Paul says, some, some are, you see, these kind of things you're seeing, some are like that. But you've been justified. You've been sanctified. All right? So Jesus paid for every crime that you've ever, ever done. That is very, very important to understand. And we can even confirm in Romans 4, 24 to 25. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. All right. Let's see also a couple, maybe two more. Romans 5, 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. So if one man, we became sinners, Adam. One man, we can also be cleansed and become righteous. Who is Jesus? Romans 5.18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, a judgment came upon all men unto condemnation, even so by the righteousness of free gift of one, the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. You see, we are justified. Once you get saved, you're standing. According to God, you're justified. All right? So once you understand that, you know, you know and you understand that, hey, my standing can never change. According to God, I am justified. I am 100% justified. So the next thing that we'll check is that we are heirs or we have an inheritance. We are heirs with Christ. All right? Heirs. Inheritance. All right? Uh, with Christ. So we are heirs with Christ. The Bible tells us we are heirs as well. All right, with Christ. Let's see Acts 26, 18. 
to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You receive inheritance by having faith. Once you believe the gospel, you also become a heir with Christ. You are fellow heirs with Christ. Such a beautiful thing. So you should always know that you're standing one day, one time, you will hear with Christ. All right? Christ will rule. He'll be the king of kings. You will rule with him. You will rule where? In the millennial kingdom. You'll be there ruling. Okay? With him. First Peter 1. Uh, 3 to 4, it says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You're told that you have inheritance which is incorruptible. It, it, nobody can corrupt that. Do you see the Bible always tell us, don't, don't be so too much about the things of the world. Focus on the things above. Put your riches in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Why? Because that is where you put your inheritance, which is incorruptible. So when you see some guys like Joel Austin and the other people wake up every day and tell you about, you know, your best life now, seven things to these, four ways to, to earn your best life, you, all those kind of things which don't make sense. They are trying to make you grab hold of this world and you don't focus on the things above if you see somebody preaching all about prosperity you know you can do this you can achieve this you can achieve that your best life you can get these seven things to achieve in your goal the power within you all those kind of things according to me what i think they are more so cults because they are they are focusing us on the world while god is telling us focus on things above it's not bad to be uh, having a good life but if you focus all your life about, I want my best life now, <laughs> my friend, I think uh, that's, that's the reason why we see even so many people, when something small happens to them, maybe uh, somebody gets sick, you all start saying, oh, there is no God, there is no God, I don't care, I think God has left me. Why? Because you have always thought one thing, you have always known and loved the world so much. Look at the apostles. Who had a good life? No one. Paul was really poor. Most of the apostles, actually all of them, they died very bad deaths. I think the only one who died a natural death, death was uh, John. But still he was at the island of Patmos. He had been put inside boiling oil, but it could not work. He could not die because Jesus had, had planned maybe to use him in the revelation. And, and you see all these kind of things. Did those people have their best life now? No. So when you see somebody telling you that, you must tell them, mm-mm. Something is really wrong with you. All right? So, also the Bible also tells us that you are kept. God keeps your salvation. You don't keep your salvation. Even this inheritance, it's not kept for you. You, you don't keep it yourself. It is kept for you. Your salvation is kept for you. God keeps it. So, and if Jesus is keeping your salvation, then how can you lose something you're not even keeping? How can you? In 1 Peter 1.5, it says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You're kept by the power of God. The power of God is keeping you. God sees you doing this and then he corrects you. He puts you here. He, you know, the Bible says he chastes. He chastes. Or he corrects those that are his. All his children, they are good sons, they are bad sons. He always corrects them. Okay? So how big or small that inheritance is, it will depend with you, all right? It will depend with you and your works. Now, that's where the works thing come. You see, you're not saved by works. You're saved by faith plus nothing. Faith alone. Repent. Repentance is stop believing in this, believe in this. Be stop believing in yourself or in idols and all those things. Believe in Jesus. Full stop. That is salvation. But now, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.10, that we are God's workman. We need to work good things, be a good testimony, preach to others, tell people about Christ, bring people's souls to Christ. So those, those things that you're doing, the works, are going to give you a better inheritance. So once, if you get saved and you say, I'll go on doing my own things, then you have no inheritance, you have nothing. 
<laughs> All right? The Bible tells us, Colossians 3, 23 to 24, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as, as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. We are called to serve. Once you are saved, we are called to serve. Don't just sit down there and then you say, I won't do nothing. Even if it's just a YouTube video like this, you can copy what I'm preaching. Go and sit down somewhere. Tell other people, hey, listen, this is your standing versus your state. Tell others about Christ. You see, you will gain more inheritance in heaven. Because you will be planting, you'll be telling somebody, who knows, somebody might hear this and then he's saved. You have somebody who will be your inheritance in heaven, all right? Titus 3, 7 says, that being justified by his grace, we, sh we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we are heirs, all right? So the other thing, number seven, eternal life. We get eternal life, which is a gift. Eternal eternal life which is a gift all right we get eternal life which is a gift eternal means forever so somebody telling you that you know you are saved but then you can lose it then why did god put the word eternal there why do we have the word eternal what does eternal mean according to you if i tell you i give you this felt pen eternally don't ever return it for me don't i give you this house, it's yours forever. What does it mean? If maybe we argue one day, should I come and tell you, oh, give me back my house? You tell me you gave me forever. Why are you picking it up? So salvation is eternal. It's forever. It's everlasting. John 5, 24, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come in condemnation but is passed from death unto life so once you believe you have eternal life john 3 36 he that believeth on the son has everlasting life and he, sh and he that believeth not the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abideth on him you can as well go let me give you a couple of verses because i don't uh, spend a lot of time just go and see what the Bible says about eternal life, all right? Just go and check. Uh, you can write them down. John 10, 28, speak of, about eternal life. Acts 13, 46 and uh, 48. 1 Timothy 1, 16. Romans 6, 23. You can also check John 5, 11 to 20. All these verses are talking about eternal life. You have eternal life, you have eternal life, you have eternal life. The other thing is that we are in Christ. We are in Christ. In Christ. We are in Christ. So Christ is inside us. Okay? And also, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And Christ in us. All right? We are in Christ and Christ is in us. That's, a, that's a, very, a very good point. Most people don't know this. You are in Christ. Once you're saved, you're in Christ and Christ is also in you. So if you're in Christ, how can you lose your salvation? How can Christ go to hell if he's in you and you're in him? So if you're in Christ, then it already means because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, you're also there with him. <laughs> so... Once you're saved, you're already sitting in heaven with Christ. Let's see this. Romans 11.5. The Bible says, So we, being made one body in Christ, and everyone member, members of one another. So we, being, being many, we are one body in Christ. And everyone members of one of another. So we are members in Christ. We are in Christ. All right? Once saved, we know that we are in Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but to us there is but one God, the Father, in whom all are things, and we are in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things are we by him. We are in Christ. In Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 30. But of him are, are ye in Christ Jesus. Of, 
uh, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We are in Christ. I am in Christ inside there. All right. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. If that one doesn't convince you, then I don't know. All right. Then the other thing is that we are secure in Christ. We are secure. Secure. Uh, secure in Christ. So if you know you're secure in Christ, then why, why the worry? Why should you worry that, hey, I'm go- I, uh, I might have thought something. I might- now, imagine something. Huh? In this world that we're living today, how many times do you do things which are evil? According to science and according to what people say, in a day you can make about 10,000 different thoughts. You can think over 10,000 times. Now, out of 10,000 times of thinking, tell me, how many times have you thought evil? <laughs> Probably 70% you've thought evil. You've thought, hey, this person does something bad to me. I hate this person. I feel that, hey, I'm enjoying this. I... Some things that you could not have enjoyed. You're walking and then all of a sudden, uh, maybe you see the way... Just so many things that right now you... you, you probably meet a policeman and you're not wearing mask and then he's here he's telling you okay give me only 200 shillings or else i'll put you in quarantine and you have to pay the 28000 so you're like oh now what happens and then at the end of the day even if you have not paid that bribe you've already thought eh, this can be a good idea i'd rather give him 200 shillings. already you've sinned how many times do you sin so many times you sin so, so many times. And if you don't understand this, then at the end of the day, you'll be thinking you're good. But one thing is that we are secure in Christ. Whether you thought or you did not think, you can't go to hell. Let me tell you. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. The Bible says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall, uh, shall ye also appear with him in glory. We are told our life is hidden with Christ. So Christ is hiding our life. So if he's hiding our life and he's already in heaven and he has our life there with him in heaven, so who is going to take away our life? We're already secure. Paul says, who or what can separate us from the love of Christ? Are they things above, here or below, anywhere? Nothing can separate you. You're already secure. You know you're sure. You're sure, 100%. Now, let's check about our state. Our state, that is a condition every day. Your condition. We have already understood our position in Christ. Where we are, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are a new creature. We are forgiven our sins. We are born again. We become sons of God. We are justified. We are heirs. We have inheritance with Christ. We have eternal life. We have we in Christ. And Christ is in us. Secure in Christ as well. Now let's see. What is our state? Our daily condition. Condition of our body every day. According to the flesh. Now the first state is that we are dead. According to God we are dead. Dead to God. <laughs> he already, when he looks at our body, he's like, ah, that's already dead. It's already dead. Uh, like I told you here, he cut us off. This body is dead. When you die, it's going to the grave. But then the soul and the spirit, the, the, this is the purchased possession. All right? The purchased possession. This is the purchase possession. What Christ purchased is the soul and the spirit. All right? So he did not purchase the body. The body is going to give us a new body, a glorified body when he comes, Jesus. So we are dead unto God. Colossians 3, 5 to 6, it says, Mortify therefore your members, or kill. Make them dead, which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, incordinance, inordinance, affection, evil, conspiracy, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of a disobedience, in which also you walked sometime when you lived in them. So he's saying, once you're saved, according to God, you're dead. But then remember, you're still here on earth. You have not gone to heaven. 
So now what happens is walk in the spirit. Don't walk in your state, in your body, your flesh. So if you feel your body is telling you, I, I want to covet this, I want to go and steal this, I want to go and do this and that, I want to fornicate, I want to do all this. Tell it, hey, <laughs> man, you're dead. Stop disturbing me, you're dead. I'd rather walk in the spirit. I don't want to walk in the flesh. Because everything that you're doing here in the flesh, you will reap what you sow here in the flesh. You do something in the flesh, you reap in the flesh. All right? So, you're dead according to God. He looks at you and he says, no, I don't see you there. But of course, don't say there are things that you can do for the flesh. Like, for example, you won't feel hungry and your, your stomach is doing and then you say, you dead man. <laughs> Dead man, don't talk to me. No, you have to go and eat. You have to go and take a shower. You have to do all those kind of things. But I'm talking about the sin. According to God, when it comes to sin, you're dead. Number two, this body, yes, according to God, you're dead. But then the body is also always sinful. Always sinful. All right, your body, yes, according to God, you're dead. But then your flesh is always sinful, sinful all the time. Let's see, Romans 7, 14. It says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So this is Paul saying, giving his stories to saying, guys, I, I know the law is spiritual, but personally, I'm carnal. I am sold under sin. I'm, <sighs> this is me. Yes, the greatest apostle. But then. See, verse 15 what says, For that which I do, I allow not. For, that, for what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. He's saying, I, I really want to do good, but I find myself doing what is evil. Verse 16, If then I do that which I would not, and I consent unto the law that it is good, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So he's saying, I always like to do good. To do good, to walk in the uh, spirit. But then I always find myself doing wrong. But if I'm doing wrong, it is not me, the new creature doing wrong. It is now the flesh which is doing the wrong things. All right? It's the flesh which is doing the wrong things. Listen. And then, uh, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, into brackets, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bring me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he's saying, myself, I always find I'm serving this law of sin. But I really want to serve the law of God. Yes, I'm trying to do my best, but I always find I'm sinful. So Paul is already telling us that this body is already very sinful. It always wants to do what is wrong. Then the other thing is that the flesh is lustful to sin. Lustful to sin. You see, always sinful and lustful sin is almost the same thing. But let me just make it different. Your, your flesh is always lustful to sin. You're always, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do that. Let's see, Galatians 5.13. It says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only not use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. We are told, we have been given liberty. We can choose. We can do whatever we want. And still, once we are saved, we are saved. You can do anything that you want and you can't go to hell. I'm not telling anybody to do that. But should you do what is wrong? Remember, the Bible told us that we have an inheritance. We have inheritance in heaven. So this inheritance will be determined by what you did, your works, how you lived. You'll get the inheritance. And this one is proved 
proven very well by the kinds of judgments we have. You know, the Christians, people who are saved, will not go through the same judgment like the sinners. We, we will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Once the rapture happens, there's our judgment, which is the judgment of works, the things that we did. Okay? We're not going to be judged like, okay, you're a sinner, go to hell. No, you're no longer a sinner. We did an out-of-court agreement when we believed Christ and he was imputed. We had the Christ imputed righteousness. So this one about going to hell, that one is off. But now we'll be judged for this. But then sinners will not be judged for that because already they have not gotten Christ's righteousness because they have never believed the gospel. So for them, they love another judgment, which is called the Great White Throne Judgment after their thousand years, Millennial Kingdom. So you see, that one already tells you that, hey, my friend, you can go to hell. But now what you need to do is don't walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit. And that's why in Ephesians 4.30, it tells us, don't grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you're sealed unto the day of redemption. So why would the Holy Spirit grieve inside you? Because when you do something wrong, it's feeling, ah, you feel bad. When you feel bad, you see, a saved person can never enjoy sin. You'll go where people are drinking, they're doing wrong things, and then you're there and you feel like, I'm totally off. Yes, you might be there partying, drinking, doing all those kind of things, but you feel, I am totally off here. I feel grieving in my heart. That is the Holy Spirit who is grieving. All right? Galatians 5.16, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lasteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do things that you would. But if you be led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So the spirit is fighting to do something. The flesh is fighting to do another. They are fighting all through. But whoever you feed is on which is going to grow. You feed the spirit, then you're going to be more spiritual. You feed the flesh, then you're going to be more carnal. Now the works of the flesh, verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, when you do these things, your inheritance will be cut off. You may inherit almost nothing, zero, when you get to heaven. Your inheritance, you'll get nothing. So do what is right so that you can get inheritance in heaven. So, like I told you before, what you do in the flesh, you will pay for it in the flesh. All right? So for those who think like, you know, you'll go scot-free. No, you'll not go scot-free. Anything that you're going to do in the flesh, you will pay for it in the flesh. You will not go to hell but you will pay for it. Get a gun today and say, yeah, I'm saved. And you go to the bank and you start uh, stealing. You will go to jail or you'll be shot or you'll be killed or something will happen. You will have to pay. The wages of sin is death. Let's see someone here who was a sinner. Yes, a very bad fornicator, but he still went to heaven. But still he was saved. His spirit, his soul was, was saved. I'm not telling you this so that I can show you how you can sin. No. It's to show you that you need to do what is right. Walk in the, in, the, in, the, in the spirit, not in the flesh. I'm saying this because of those people always condemning others and telling them that you will lose your salvation. You have lost. You need to do works. It's the gospel of works. No. In Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. You can't go to hell. There is nothing which, which can be done. You can't go to hell. You have to understand this in depth very, 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 very much. Let me explain to you. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5, we see Paul talking about a certain guy who is a fornicator. And uh, let's see, did this person go to hell? He is a, he's a Christian. He is a Christian, a born-again person. But did he go to hell? Let's see. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 to 5, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as it's not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. This guy is so bad until he's taking his father's wife. And you, have, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from you. 
For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has done so this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is Paul giving his judgment. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver, listen, listen to this point, to deliver such one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, is that fornicator going to hell? No, he's not going to hell. The flesh, he will pay with his flesh. Maybe he will get some disease or maybe something will happen or maybe he will, uh, you know, he will be beaten by, you know, the public or something. You know, God has ways. He, he, he says that I chasteth those that I love. I, I, I punish my children. So having seen that, that is very important to understand our standing and our state. Our state is sinful, but our standing in Christ can never change. We are secure. We are in Christ. We have eternal life. We are, as long as you believe the gospel, you believe the gospel, you're saved 100%. Nobody can change that. And you have to understand this with all your might. Let me give uh, the final remark about all that what I've spoken about. The final remark is all this. You need to have a good testimony for Jesus Christ. When you do and you show a bad testimony for Christ, you're going to pay for it in the flesh. For those people who are sinners, they are fornicators, they are doing all those wrong things, that's a bad testimony to Christ. So Christ will just sit down and say, okay, you, that's why we are told the wages of sin is death. He can just look and say, that child of mine is really doing horrible things, making my testimony be so bad. I, I'd rather pick him up. I'd rather you know, pick him up. You know, you die. You, you end up doing wrong things and you die. Wages of sin is death. You die. But when you die, yes, you'll go to heaven. But then you've been a killer. You've been doing this because I know I'm saved. I've been sleeping around. I've been uh, drinking all day. I've been doing all the wrong things. <laughs> Live a good testimony. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of good of God standeth sure, having this seal the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So if you name the name of Christ, you say, I'm a Christian, I am saved. Depart from iniquity. Stop doing what is wrong. Do what is right, because that is what is needed of you. So I hope you've been blessed. I hope you've been able to understand. And this one has been a blessing to you. That is your standing and that is your state. Please kindly you can share this video so that somebody else can hear. And I'm sure the message can also reach to other people. God bless you and have a blessed time. Thanks.